the title of the message comes from verse 11. If you look at verse 11 there again, it says, uh, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I think that's such a great sentence there. Uh, you know, we don't want him to get advantage of us. We don't want him to, to have his way because, and then it says, for we are not ignorant of his devices, right? We, uh, as Christians, we should know that Satan's out to get us, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. We understand that. And we understand that he has some devices, okay? He's got some uh, plans uh, and some ways that he's going to trip us up and cause us to fall and, and all that. So the title of the message is Satan's Devices. Satan's Devices. Now, what is a device? Most commonly now we think of device like our cell phones and, uh, you know, iPads and, you know, devices like that. Uh, or something that we would hold in our hand, like an invention or something like that. And, and the words, it, it, it does have the same idea, like something that was created for a purpose and all that. That comes from the same idea. But basically, just in short, the word device is simply something, in the Bible particularly, is typically just talking about something that's devised. All right, You devise a plan or whatever, that what you come up with is a device. Okay, so... Uh, so sometimes this could be something that is crafted with the hands, right? You had this, uh, this device, something that was, has a purpose, uh, uh, an invention or something like that. I'm going to look at, just, just for the introduction, we'll look at some uh, examples. Okay, so look at Second Chron Chronicles. Let me mark my place there. All right, Second Chronicles. Look at chapter 2. Verse 11. Second Chronicles 2:11 says uh No, I'm sorry, 2:14. It says the son of a of a woman of the daughters of Dan and his father was a man of Tyre, skillful to work in gold and in silver and brass and iron, in stone, in timber, in purple and blue, and in fine linen and in crimson, also to grave any manner of graving and to find out every device which shall be put to him uh, with thy cunning men and with the cunning men of my Lord David uh, thy father. So you see often in the Bible when skillful men were called upon, you know, to create something with their hands, their, you know, whether it's a work of art or crafting something, uh, it talks about this idea of it being a device, okay, the device there. Look at Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5, and we'll go to verse 12. Job 5, 12 says, He disappointeth the devices of the crafty, so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. Look at Acts 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 29. <clears throat> it says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Okay, so, so we're, you know, oftentimes in the Bible, we'll, you'll see that it is kind of linked to something that's crafted, something that's made. And so when we talk about a device like that, you know, we, we can understand that. But also in the Bible, in fact, most of the times when it talks about device, uh, it's talking about something that is just imagined or planned. It's not necessarily something that's going to take shape and something that's crafted with the hands. Sometimes it's just simply something that's planned out with the mind. Okay, so uh, back to Job again.
And this time go to Job 21. Job chapter 21, verse 27. Behold, I know your thoughts and the devices which ye wrongfully Im Im imagine against me. Okay, so this is something that's just imagine, you know, something that's, that's, you know, a plan, a scheme, if you will. All right, Psalm chapter 10, one, one book over to the right. Psalm 10, verse 2, The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. Okay, and so a lot of times it's just talking about the ways or the plan of something that is devised. So uh, simple, simply put, is a device is something that is devised. All right, so if, if Paul said, you know, hey, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices, well, then we definitely want to make sure that we aren't ignorant of his devices either, right? And I don't think he's speaking for every Christian. He's just saying, look, we know. There are some things that Paul himself had warned them and said, hey, we, we know that Satan's going to try to tempt us this way and he's going to do that. And we have a lot of examples in the Bible, a lot of things uh, that we see about Satan's intentions and how Satan tries to uh, plan of attacks a, a upon God's people particularly. And so, uh, so I want to talk about just a, a few different ways here, a uh, few different uh, devices of Satan. Okay, so number one is this. Devise plans to complicate the gospel. Satan wants to complicate the gospel. We see this more and more every day, it seems like. Maybe it's just something that, you know, once you see it, you can't unsee it, and you start seeing more and more of it. Maybe uh, uh, it's no different than it was 20 years ago. But to me, it just seems like there's this, you know, agenda that Satan has to cause good men of God who are saved and believe the gospel uh, but for some reason, because of the preaching that's out there and maybe these all different like religions influencing each other and coming together, uh, some reason this Protestant uh, um, and Reformed theology or whatever has influenced Christians or Bible-believing Christians has influenced them to you know, preach what sounds like a works-based salvation. And a lot of times uh, when they present the gospel, it sounds so hard. And that's why we can talk to people that even go to Baptist churches just tonight. You know, we talked about somebody going to a Baptist, they, they went to a Baptist church. And when we talked to them, they said, well, I think you just need to be a really good person. And you got to change your life and you got to commit to the Lord and, and all these kinds of things. You hear this all the time. And where does that come from? Well, it comes from somebody being confused and preaching a false gospel and oftentimes if you think about that that is just because that person uh, you know now here's here's the thing now sometimes it would make sense first of all that this would be satan's biggest agenda right i mean this is where he's going to put most of his effort in devising a plan you know his devices right he's going to devise a plan to stop men of god who know the gospel from preaching the gospel Right. So therefore, hey, if the easiest thing in the world to go out there, if the gospel's simple, the easiest way thing in the world is just go out there and give people give people a free gift. Right. Show them in the Bible how God said you can be saved if you just trust in Jesus Christ and what he did. And you preach that. Now, I realize there's a little bit more you can study and how to present the gospel. I don't expect that everybody's just got that down where, it's, you know, where it can, comes out of their mouth real simple. But the, at the end of the day, it is a pretty simple thing to learn how to do. You know, it might help to memorize a few verses, but you don't even have to do that. You can have them marked in your Bible and you could have like a little map that says turn here and turn there. Or you can read it right off of the back of a, a gospel track. I mean, really, uh, there's a little a young kid that said he got saved uh, you know, a couple years back or whatever. And, and brother just today and brother David was talking to him and. He was a little confused at first, and then he began to talk about his salvation experience and, and said that he was saved whenever he... I hate that word, salvation experience, but you know what I mean. The day that he got saved. <laughs> All right, so he was talking about how, uh, how you know, he heard... He, he was asking him, like, well, you know, what did Jesus do? And he's preaching the gospel to him, and he said, I was saved. And he said, he said I even saved my, my brothers. And he is saying he, 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 you know, told them how, about how he got saved, and he led them in a prayer and all this kind of stuff. I just thought that was really cool. Kid, 10 years old, I think and he was saved when he was eight and wanted to start doing that. You know, we talked, uh, anyway, so, so you know, he understood the simplicity of the gospel and had a desire to, to, to teach that to other people. So Brother David gave him a stack of, 
of our invites and said, hey, you can go give the gospel. And if, if you need help on the back of the track, just read those verses to them and all that stuff. It's really not that difficult, you know. I always think about the blind man. You know, he's saying, I don't even, I, I don't know all these things. He's talking to the Pharisees and scribes. He's like, I don't know all these things. He said, but one thing I know, I was, I was blind and now I see, right? That's kind of what, it, if you've been saved, you, you probably should know how to tell someone else how to get saved. So it's one of the simplest things that we can just go out and do that. And if you think about that, if every believer went out and, 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 and duplicated that process and, and shared the gospel with somebody else and got them saved, think about how many people in this world would be saved. But unfortunately, so few go out and do that. And sometimes it's because they're confused. They don't know what to say. They're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing. And sometimes it's because they really in their mind think, oh, I can't just go tell them the gospel and they get saved. You know, they have to like change their life and they got to do all these things. And so they put an emphasis on that and that stops them from preaching the gospel. They say, well, no, I, I don't want to mess it up. So I'll just put the track on their door, let the Holy Spirit do the work or whatever. But God told us to go and preach the gospel to every creature. So Satan, one of the, Satan's devices, a lot of his devices are going to be geared towards causing people to complicate the gospel. He can't necessarily stop the gospel from being preached. The gospel is going to be preached up until the last day, right? And then even after Christians are gone, the gospel is going to be preached by 144,000 and two witnesses, right? So, uh, so even after Christians are gone, he's going to send some, uh, some folks. He's going to leave here and uh, preach the gospel. Okay, so, uh, so Satan would love, though, to complicate the gospel. Now, if he could get some false prophets, right? And he's pretty good at that, getting some false prophets to just convince people that they're godly, convince people, you know, that they love them and they want to help them and, and, and all that, you know, he's going to do everything he can to accomplish that. Now look at uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, and I, re I want to read this to you. 2 Corinthians 11. So it's a little bit of a lengthy passage here, so follow along, pay attention. Uh, this, is, this is what we can expect out of Satan here. 2 Corinthians 11, starting verse 1. <clears throat> Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. For I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see how Satan, just like, in the, you know, God gave Eve like one command. And then what does he do? He comes in, he tries to tri trick, trip her up a little bit and confuses God's word. You know, hey, that's what happens. That's what Satan's doing today with a lot of modern versions. He's kind of muddying that up and making it a little bit harder to understand God's Word. And, and Satan's got all kinds of devices. You can expect that he's going to devise a plan to complicate the gospel, okay? And here's what he's saying, uh, that, you know, just like Sir, Satan did that, you know, he would corrupt you from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached... Or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been throughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing abasing myself? that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of, Christ, of God freely. I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. He's like, man, I, I've been taking money, you know, for these, people, these people's missionary offerings. <laughs> I've been taking that so that I could preach the gospel to you. And he's saying, like, I robbed them, especially if you're not going to, if it's not going to do any good. And then, it didn't mean he literally like robbed money out of the offering plate. Don't, don't misunderstand. <laughs> okay. And when I was present with you and wanted, uh, and wanted meaning he, he lacked something, he needed something, I wanted, I was chargeable to no man. 
For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself, as the truth of Christ is in me. No man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, and may uh, cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself transformed, is transformed to an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. Now look, he's saying this. Look, don't be surprised when there's people that seem like angels of light. I mean, they seem like this great godly men who are preaching these wonderful things. And don't be surprised that if they're just doing, if they're just a result of Satan's devices, they're just doing the bidding for Satan. Shouldn't be surprised by that because even Satan himself can, can change himself into the minister of light, right? He can, he is very deceiving. And why that's important is because a lot of people are like, well, certainly that guy saved, you know, we certainly he's preaching the right gospel and you look at him and he looks the part and he's smiley and he just loves everybody. And they're like, look, can't you see a spirit? He's so loving and he's so, uh, he's so gracious and he's such a man of God. But look, he might be preaching a false gospel. He might be preaching a works-based salvation. He might be muddying things up and confusing the gospel. And so there's a responsibility on us to recognize Satan's devices. And look, Satan's devices sometimes are going to look good. They're going to be, you know, uh, easy to be deceived by them. But we need to not be ignorant of Satan's devices, okay? And one thing he'd love to do is complicate the gospel. So here's what we need to do when we recognize a false prophet, you know. Now, let me say, everyone that just preaches, now people are going to be preaching a false gospel, you know, they, that's for sure. But I would say not everybody that preaches a false gospel is a false prophet. And let me show you what I mean. I know people who have over the years started muddying the way that they present the gospel. And it's just because they got confused and men that they trusted started saying, no, when you preach the gospel, you got to preach this. You got to do that. You got to expect a, their life to change. And you got to do all this kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, what happens is those people started preaching the gospel incorrectly. And, and they started muddying things up, and then they started preaching practically a works-based salvation. And they say, no, 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 I'm saved. I know it's not works-based salvation. And they'll quote the right scriptures to you because they are saved, and they know better. But when they present to somebody else, they're like, no, 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 you can't just preach the gospel and expect people to get saved. I mean, you need to, there needs to be repentance. There needs to be this. And the, and the only reason that they're falling on that is because somebody preached in a crafty way you know, and may, whether or not that person was a false prophet or not, they were preaching a false gospel and, it, and, and, it's, and it's muddied things up and it's all Satan's devices. We don't want to find ourselves guilty of propagating Satan's devices. You know, we, we want to make sure that we're doing it right. And so we have to recognize, number one, you know, if we know someone is a false prophet, I mean, you've, you've, you've talked to them, you've showed them from the scripture and you've said, look, what you're doing is dangerous because really that's kind of like a works-based salvation and you're showing them. And if they are not listening to that, in fact, usually what happens is they'll start all of a sudden calling you the false prophet and saying, no, 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 you got to preach it this way. And, and they just stand real firm on that. That we probably just need to have nothing to do with those guys and certainly not promote them or try to team up with them or something. They're preaching a false gospel. The Bible says, let them be accursed. You know, don't have anything to do with them. <clears throat> But if it's somebody that we know are saved and they're just kind of confused and they're messed up on that and they're just falling into this, uh, this common teaching of Lordship Salvation or something, I think the best that we can do is try to reprove, rebuke, and exhort, you know, like the Bible says to do, and just kind of show them from the Bible and plead with them and say, don't muddy the gospel, don't do that, and, uh, and, and try our best to, to, uh, to share that with them, okay? So, uh, so that's, you know, the uh, best thing you can do is if, if you, you know, if you're not... A preacher maybe has a slight responsibility in that area, but the best thing you can do is probably just don't link up with those people and don't don't follow them because uh, they're preaching a false gospel, and that is the devised plan of Satan. Okay, it's one of Satan's devices. So first of all, Satan's devices. Okay, he devises plans to complicate the gospel, and uh, we see that we don't want to do that. The gospel of Jesus Christ is free. 
You know, Jesus Christ did all, he paid for it, he gave his life, and all people need to do is accept that and put their faith in that gospel. It's not, uh, it's not a works-based salvation. Okay, number two, uh, another one of Satan's devices, devised plans to cause believers to turn away from following God. Look at Job 1. That would, you know, that, that could kind of sound like I'm saying the same thing, but what I mean is just a Christian, maybe they even believe right. You know, maybe they would even say, you know, I know I'm saved. I do believe the Bible, but I'm just tired of this. I'm not going to live for the Lord anymore. You know, I know, I know several people that have done that. And for whatever reason, they're just like, you know, they'll blame it on the fact that somebody did them wrong. They'll blame it on, you know, the fact that, you know, there's a bunch of hypocrites in church or, or whatever happens. It's all part of Satan's scheme and his devices. And he loves to turn uh, people away from the Lord and get them to stop following. What did I say? Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, verse 11. <clears throat> of course, this you're familiar with this story. I think everybody in here is. Satan is uh, trying to uh, accuse Job to God. And God's saying, hey, have you considered my, my servant here? And so here's what Satan says in Job 1, the 11. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And of course, as a result, God allows that, Job loses family members. He loses his wealth and his property and his, and, and all this, and uh, and he doesn't curse God. And so, look at chapter two, verse five. Satan comes again to the Lord, and Satan answered uh, the Lord, verse four, and said, "Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now." And touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And so Job then ends up with boils from his head to his toe, some kind of sores on his body that were painful and and uh, just miserable. And, uh, and and he's he's sitting there in agony, and he's like, I haven't done anything wrong. Why did God take my family away? Why did he allow all these things to happen? Why am I sitting in misery? And then he's got his friends sitting around, and they're accusing him too. And they're saying, look, God wouldn't allow this to happen if you weren't a bad person. And so what did you do wrong? And and they're just accusing him. He's like, I didn't do anything wrong. So then his wife comes to him. Look, look at uh, chapter 2, verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost, not, uh, dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Right? Guess what? This is all Satan's devices. He's devised this plan. And he said, hey, God. Now, God does not ignorant. God knew what he was doing, but he said, Hey God, you know, he, he's only serving you because you give him everything. But if you take away what he has, he'll stop serving you. And so God's providing this picture for us, of course. And he allows just like he always does with his prophets and all, he, he allows them to go through some, some things so that he could use that to, uh, to put into the Bible and teach us these lessons for today. So he says, Hey, go ahead, you know, take away his things. Just don't touch it. Just don't touch his body. And so he takes away these things. Satan comes back and says, I know he's still serving you, but that's because you took away his things, but you didn't hurt him. Now hurt him. Why don't you just hurt him? And, and so he gave him these, these boils, and then his wife is like, hey, curse God and die. Look, that was all part of Satan's plan. That's what Satan wanted from the beginning. And again, God's not surprised by that, but that's, that was one of Satan's devices. Okay, So we need not to be ignorant about that. Satan sometimes, you know, you'll be going through some bad things happen in our life and and I don't know how he does it. I don't completely understand. Uh, you know, you know, not everybody who is influenced by Satan is Satan is demon possessed. But sometimes he'll just cause like your friends will start coming to you and they'll they'll say, man, I don't understand why you're still serving that God. I don't understand why, you know, why you don't do this. You need to just leave the ministry. You need to quit serving God, quit going to church. You need to, you know, go join this field or you need to leave and go here. Or every all these kinds of things. We need to, in our mind, realize when those temptations come and those those tests come, hey, this is just one of Satan's devices. He's just trying to get me to stop serving the Lord, turn my back on him, follow the things of this world, follow the flesh. That Satan would, would love nothing more, first of all, to complicate the gospel, but then he would love to see his believers just turn away and stop following God. If he can get you to stop following God, you're not going to be able to influence other people. You're not going to be able to bring forth the fruit that Christians are supposed to bring forth because you turned your back and you stopped following God. Look at Luke 22. Luke 
Luke chapter 22. In verse 31. Again, Peter is faithfully following the Lord, you know, up until the end. And now Christ is getting ready to go to the cross and something happens. And, uh, and, and Peter is just feeling like really, you know, kind of scared, like not wanting to be associated with Christ. And he's, and he's, and he ends up, he's going to end up denying him. Right. So yeah, Luke 22 verse 31 says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, that's another name for Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee. That thy that they uh, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. Some people say Peter wasn't saved, and so he still had to get converted and be saved. <laughs> it's kind of weird how people in, uh, twist that. But here's what he's saying: like you're gonna fall back, you're gonna turn your back on me, you're gonna deny me. He says, but look, then when you've converted, what he, all he means is whenever you come back. And, you, and you're ready to do things right, and you're ready to serve me again. He's like, when you come back, uh, when you have, how did he say that? Uh, uh, when you have been converted, uh, let's see, strengthen thy brethren. Remember, Jesus says, do you love me? Feed my sheep. You know, do you love me? He says it three times, right? Just like he denied Christ three times. Now he says, hey, if you love me, go feed my sheep. He knew that that was the plan for Peter, but Satan wanted to stop him from doing that because he was going to lead the disciples. He was going to teach the brethren and he was going to strengthen them. And as a result, you know, uh, uh, people go out into Samaria and they go into the uttermost part of the world preaching the gospel. And if he could have just stopped Peter from having an influence and just kind of let all the disciples just scatter and stop serving the Lord, that's what Satan wants to do more than anything. So we can not be ignorant of Satan's devices. We know he is going to devise plans, you know, not only to muddy the gospel, not only to get us to stop preaching the gospel, but also to get us to just kind of stop serving the Lord. You know, stop coming to church. Stop, you know, doing anything you can do to support the church. Uh, even stop contri contributing your tithes and offerings. I mean, anything he can do to stop the work from going and being strengthened and all that kind of stuff. We need to recognize that when things happen, you know, be thinking about that. Is this one of Satan's devices? We should be planned for that. Okay, so number three, Satan's devices. Okay, he, devise, uh, he devises plans to cause believers to lack self-control. Now, I'm not talking about believers who turn their back, they stop following God. I'm talking about people who still go to church, they still serve the Lord. But, he, but Satan says, okay, I can't get you to preach a false gospel. I can't get you to stop serving the Lord. But here's what I can do. I can get you to start losing your temper. I can get you to kind of back off a little bit, you know, and throw a temptation in there. Allow things in your life to consume you to where I can just trip you up a little bit and I can get you to lose your self-control. Okay, go to 1 Corinthians 7. Here it seems kind of like an odd example here. Uh, but this is where he's talking about fasting. And I preached uh, here recently a little bit about that, how we can, uh, you know, fasting can help us to get, get back on, on track and those things. Okay, 1 Corinthians 7. And look at verse 5. He says, he, okay, let's back up actually. Uh Verse 4, he's talking about the, the married relationship between the husband and the wife. Okay? He says, let the husband render, uh, verse 3, let the husband render uh, unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. And so the idea is like if the, you know, the wife needs a certain kind of attention that married people give each other, you know, the husband needs not to defraud her and the other way around. Then he says this in verse five, defraud ye not one another, except it be with content for a time. I mean, consent for a time that ye pray. I'm sorry, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. OK, so he's saying like, like the lack of self-control is what that word means. And so he's saying like, you know, you, 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 here's one exception. You know, there might be a time where you guys 
say, you know what, let's just take a little break. And for fasting sake, because we're fasting and all that stuff, we would even fast from that intimate relationship, you know, and this is something that's an agreement, you know, and they might do that. But I, I've talked about there's lots of things that we might have to tr decide we're going to give up for a little bit. You know, every once in a while I'll see somebody on Facebook say, hey, I'm taking a I'm taking a purge. You know, I'm going to go a little bit of time off of Facebook or off of social media altogether, or maybe even just put my cell phone away or something. And what that usually is an indication of, I mean, I'm not judging the people to do it, but an indication that they're saying, hey, this is just consuming me, taking up too much time. Maybe there's too much drama or maybe it's just it's keeping me from doing the things I'm supposed to do. And guess what? That is a tr uh, is a real danger that we have with all the the outlets we have out there for media and entertainment and all that kind of stuff, it could get us to a point where we lack self-control. Uh, you know, um, here's something else I put on, uh, uh, on Facebook today as I was always thinking about this sermon and I wanted to give this little thing out. I think it would be a help. And I said, you know, Satan can use our devices, right? And what I mean is kind of a play on words. He can use our devices, our cell phone, TV, you know, what we listen to, the music that we listen to, you know, all the things that keep us busy and preoccupied. Satan can use our devices, right, to fulfill his devices for us, right? So he can, he can use all the things of the world that can, that can control our mind and then keep us, well, he can use that for his devices, right? Because he uh, has a plan of attack and he's trying to get us to stop uh, uh, you know, having control over the things that we do. He wants us to sin. He wants us to, to not be able to control ourselves. Look at Ephesians 6. We need to at all times be sober-minded and guard against the devil and know in our life that there's things that he's doing. There's, there's plans of attack. There's devi he's devising plans to stop us from serving him, to get us to stop preaching the true gospel, to get us to turn away from God or to at least get us to lack self-control. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse 11. All right, we got to start with verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Right? What's he doing? He's got a plan of attack. He wants to destroy us. He wants to devour us. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching there, there unto with all perseverance and supplication uh, for the saints. Now, if you... Follow the example of Jesus whenever Jesus was tempted, of, uh, when you know, he was baptized and then he went off into the wilderness and he was tempted by Satan. If you follow his advice, first of all, he was in prayer and he had fasted for 40 days, right? So right before this, uh, this temptation. And so, you know, he was in tune with the Lord. You know, he had been praying with the Lord. This is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be in prayer. Uh, we're supposed to be praying. Uh, uh, preparing for Satan's devices, okay? And then when Satan attacked and Satan is trying to tempt him and cause him to sin, whatever, what did he do? He quoted scripture, okay? He took that sword of the Spirit, which he's pretty familiar with, right? He's the Word. <laughs> and he's got the sword of the Spirit, and he begins quoting scripture to the Lord. So we need to be in prayer, but also we need to be, you know, we need to... If we can, memorize as much scripture as you can. But if you don't have a lot of scripture memorized, you need to have it in your hand, be able to read it, be able to uh, uh, understand it, and be able to use it, right? To come back at the devil and, and, and know your Bible, right? That's the power of God. And so, uh, so we need to be ready, and we need to be sober-minded. We need to be guarded against the devices of the devil. Now, finally, go back to our text in 2 Corinthians
2 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> Let me start reading from, uh, you know, I've read this here recently, I, I know that, but I, I want you to focus on the phrase that I got this, uh, from where I got this uh, title. All right, verse 5, But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him, and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if, uh, for if I forgive anything to whom I forgive it, for your sakes forgave I uh, it in the person of Christ." lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So, you know, according to this text here, Satan, you know, one of his devices is to get us to a point where we're not willing to forgive our brethren, right? Now, here's the first thing that I thought about. I think about this a lot, a lot with the Apostle Paul. When Paul talks about forgiving people, I always think about this. Hey, did he forgive John Mark? Is everybody familiar with that story of John Mark? Okay, so John, uh, uh, P Paul and Barnabas teamed up together, going out preaching the gospel. They take, uh, I think it's uh, Barnabas, Barnabas's nephew, and they take him along with them for the ride. And apparently something happens, and John Mark says, hey, I can't, I can't do this. Right? Some have speculated that it was just too much for him. It was too hard to work, and so he quit, and he left and went back home to his mom or whatever. All right. So later on, they go on a second journey and Barnabas is like, all right, I'll go get John Mark. And Paul's like, wait, 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 wait. Last time he left us. I'm not going to tolerate that again. And so he says, no, I can't, I, I can't work with him. So he gets Silas, Paul, I mean, Barnabas takes John Mark and they kind of go their separate ways. Now, the funny thing is the Bible never really talks about Barnabas again. It never really talks where, where Paul and Barnabas ever met each other or, or whatever. You have to kind of read between the lines. You don't know what happens. But here's what we do know happen, happened. Apparently, you know, whatever problem that Paul had with John Mark, and maybe it wasn't anything more than like, look, you know, he's a good kid. I like him, but he's just not going to cut it. I mean, he can't go with us. He's going to hinder us. You know, maybe that's all it was. But whatever beef he had with John Mark... Later on, he tells Timothy, he says, bring John, or I can't remember if he calls him John or Mark. He says, bring John, for he's profitable for me, uh, unto me for the ministry. Okay, so at some point in Paul's life, he did show grace and mercy, and he did uh, uh, show forgiveness towards John Mark. And so I think that's a good example from the life of Paul. You know, hey, there's a time to let somebody even to say, hey, we can't work together, you know, until there's repentance and there's restoration and all this kind of stuff made. Certainly there are times for that. And I'll say this, there are times when somebody commits a sin that's so hurtful and so destructive, you know, that there might not be a way to have the right kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, what you would hope to, to restoration to look like. It might never look like that. OK, there are situations people get themselves into that. That's that's just what it is. You know, you know, as a pastor, I've talked about this before. Like there might be somebody that commits some kind of sin. And even if they're repentant and I forgive them of it, I might not let them come into the church because I might be a danger to everybody else in the church. Right. There might be something I have to uh, protect, protect the church. And so I say, no, you've kind of crossed the line and you've kind of showed us that we're, you know, we, we can't we can't have that. I love you. I I. I, I you know, I forgive you, but for the sake of everybody else, you know, here's something I like to, I like to bring. I have the right to forgive anybody, right? I have the right to, somebody slaps me on the cheek. I have the right to turn to the other cheek and say, you know what? I forgive you for that slap. They slap me again. I forgive. What's the Bible say? Hey, forgive 70 times seven, right? Just keep on forgiving. And I have the right to do that. But here's what I don't have the right to do. I don't have the right to forgive somebody for somebody else. Right. If someone is harming somebody else or, well, let's say it's my family, I could be like, hey, you know, I forgive you, but I love my family 
And I'm not going to allow, to, I'm not going to take a chance that my family gets hurt. It might be wise for me to say, hey, you can't be around my family anymore, even though I love you. There are some, certain things people could do. Is that making any sense to me? All right. Uh, you know, I remember, I, I hate to get personal and use names. I'm, I'm not that kind of a guy. But uh, I remember when, when Brother Dan was coming and, and it was like, you know, we all knew he had mental issue, you know, mental health issues. And, and he did some things, you know, over time that was like, this is really scary. You know, but I kept feeling like, man, I got to forgive him. I got to love him. And I did, uh, you know, and I was very patient with him and everything. But at one point I said, you know what? You know, I've, I've, and I've talked to some of the guys that I trusted and I got their opinion. And I, and I thought about this and, and I've got this sense, this sense that nobody in the church felt safe because this guy's a ticking time bomb. We don't know what could happen. His mental state is not, you know, maybe not him, but his mind's just doing weird stuff. And he's, and he, and, and so I finally said, Hey, he's not going to come back anymore. We're just going to have to not let him come back. You know, I just found out recently he's back in, he's back in jail this time, probably for a long time. Okay. And, uh, and you know what it had to do, he's going after somebody, you know, and I won't get into any, any details about that, but, uh, but it was enough to get him in trouble. And look, that's the gut feeling that I had that, Hey, it's just a matter of time, you know, whenever he could, he could do something in his mind, you know, he might think that what he's doing is right, but that doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we don't want to, uh, to put anybody in jeopardy. Could come with somebody who, uh, you know, has committed certain sexual sins, you know, uh, you know, particularly, you know, things that, you know, we have a hard time even believing that they were ever saved. Like we're talking about reprobate type things that we'd be like, Hey, I don't care how much you say you repented of that. Like we're not, we're just going to say that you could, if you're a, if you're a reprobate, you could be totally lying to us and you could be, you know, in here to deceive again. You know, there's a, there's a chance for that. But there are some things that we have the power to forgive. Say, you know what? You're a human. You made a human mistake. You need to bear the consequences. Uh, this is a bad deal, but I don't feel like you're harmed anybody or a threat to anybody. And there, there is a time when we need to learn, Hey, I'm going to forgive this person and I'm going to do what I can uh, uh, to have them back. And so this was what Paul is saying to the church. Now he let the church make that decision. You know, this wasn't his church. He wasn't a pastor, but he was letting them make that decision. But he said, Hey, if you forgive them, I'll forgive them. You know, whatever you decide, you do it. And so sometimes a church has to get together and decide these things. But certainly what the devil would like more than anything is to get us every time somebody makes a mistake, you just kick them out of the church and you say, that's it. I don't want anything to do with that guy. And guess what happens when that, if, if that just keeps happening, guess what happens? Eventually everybody makes some kind of mistake. It gets them kicked out of the church. And now the church doesn't have any laborers. It doesn't have any, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, camaraderie. The fellowship is messed up. You know, man, I, I, I hate, again, I hate to get all personal and everything, but, you know, a couple years ago, we had uh, planned on doing a worldwide soul winning mega marathon. Everybody remember those? We did them two years in a row. They were great. This church was getting on board. This, this church was going to go uh, whole hog the next year. We were going to do this. We were going to get on board. And all of a sudden, you're right, all these uh, there was all this, this fighting in this division. Look, maybe it had to be there. I don't know. That's not my, that's not my problem. It wasn't our church. Okay. But there was this fighting and there was divisions and Hey, we're not going to use this guy anymore. That guy's not going to go. Now, ultimately we ended up not doing the soul winning event and it had to do more with COVID than anything else. Cause it was too hard for people to travel and all that kind of stuff. But you know, I don't know if it'll ever happen again because all these preachers that were working together and they were going and doing this, you know, trying to get, you know, soul winning events in every state and then in all these other different countries. It was a great work for the Lord, great exploits, you know, great things being done for the Lord. And all of a sudden it came to a halt. And I'm like, you know, man, you know, what would be really great is if people could patch that up and forgive each other and get back together so we could have our laborers and we can go back doing this kind of work. I don't know. Maybe these things can't happen. And maybe some people are beyond that restoration. Some of these things, again, it's not my church. I can't make those decisions. But for me, I feel like, you know, if, if I'm going to get to this point where I can't forgive people and, and get back to, hey, let's do the work and let's, you know, let's get that past us and move on and do what's next, you know, so that we can do great things for the Lord. I'm just giving in to Satan's devices. I'm allowing Satan's devices to come and hinder us 
from doing what God wants us to do. And that's what Paul's saying to the church of Corinth. He's saying, look, whatever, if you forgive them, I forgive them. You know, whatever you guys decide as a church, I'm for that. He's like, but I'm telling you what, there's a time whenever you need to forgive people or you not need to let them come up with over much sorrow and, uh, and you need to restore such a one. He says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. That's what he wants more than anything. Let's, let's put it this way. If he can't get us to preach the false gospel, he's going to try to get us to turn away from God. If he can't get us to turn away from God, he's going to cause us to lack self-control. You know, it's real easy for people to get into the flesh and get into different temptations and stuff like that, and they lack self-control. Guess what happens? You lack self-control, you fall into sin, right? If he can't get us to, you know, as a whole, fall into sin, what he can get us to do is to not be forgiving of those people who did fall in sin and not get them back to the church and restore them and work with them again. Not every situation allows that to happen. But if that can happen, Satan would love that. That's like his final effort is to get somebody to fall and then get everybody else to just kick them out and not have anything to do with them again. And I'm not just talking about our church. I'm saying this is a problem within churches all over, independent Baptist churches, new IFB churches. I mean, you name it, uh, whatever labels you want to put on them. Uh, this is Satan's plan. If he could get people to do that, boy, his devices have worked. Okay, when that happens, you minimize labors. You destroy the morale and the motivation of God's people working together. And here's another thing. You make people afraid, you know, that, that, that they could ever, you know, anything ever could be discovered that they might be doing wrong or, or something that they might differ from somebody else or whatever. They're afraid. And so they're concealing things and they're hiding things and they don't want that to be known because they say, hey, that happened to so-and-so and he never saw him again. You know, now look. At the same time, you don't want to allow people to, you know, nothing happens to somebody that does wrong because then everyone's like, hey, we can just live in sin and, and get away with it and nothing happens. There's a fine line there, but there's a mixture between saying, hey, I'm going to be strong, I'm going to rebuke, I'm going to maybe even kick somebody out. But down the, lo down the road, if there's restoration, I'm going to be like Paul and say, hey, that man's profitable unto me, profitable for me, unto me for the ministry, right? So, uh, so there is a great uh, uh, danger in Satan's devices when it comes to that. Promoting false gospel, turning believers away from the truth, causing believers to lose self-control, and turning people from being able to forgive each other. These are the devices of the devil, and we need not to be ignorant of his devices. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, the leading of the Spirit and, uh, and just the fellowship of believers, iron sharpening iron and, and encouraging one another. Thank you for the preaching of your word. Lord, I pray that you help us to be, to be uh, careful of Satan's devices and not to be ignorant of them and to be prepared for and put on the whole armor of God and protect ourselves from that, Lord, through your strength and your power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.